Hello, everybody. Let's get things going here. Oh, darn it. This one sucks. Attendance form. Also, one other thing. Um, And here is a link to the online tutoring. Um, so if you want help from a student tutor, you can go there and schedule an appointment. They have plenty of availability. Oh, you know what? I forgot to fill my water bottle. Just one sec. I'll be back. You guys should think of questions you want to ask though. I'll be back in one sec. these things again just so everyone can see them. Let me do this actually one sec. So here are links to both the attendance and the tutoring again. Partial fraction decomposition. Sure thing. So so Manise, just be before we get to that, I just want to I assume Manise that you're in Merck's class and I don't think Fan has talked about partial fractions yet. Is that correct? Okay. Um, before we do that, we will definitely talk about that, but before we talk about partial fractions, I just want to say a couple things. Um, so, fam, obviously you guys have a midterm that's tomorrow, although I think you can start it today. Um, I posted videos, so I posted, I sent you guys all an email, but just in case you missed the email, um, for the practice or the midterm review that I posted, I did post videos for each problem. So there's one video per problem. Problems have multiple parts. I just did them all in one shot. Each of the videos is like, I think eight minutes at the most, and some of them are like two or three. So you should definitely look at the study guide. And if you are working on it and you want to see how it's done, you should look at the video. So I don't intend to go over the study guide today just because I already went over it on video. Um, that said, if you have other questions about stuff, now is the time to ask. Good, I'm glad it's been helpful. That was definitely the intention. Um, and I definitely did make problems very similar to what he posted on his um, midterm review. Um, I felt like that, I felt the one, the, there was one he asked, I think about like doubling time or something that seemed very kind of confusing with what the multiple choice answer was because he had this like log base, some weird base. But if you look at the one I did that's similar, you should see how to do that one. Um, so let me just, let me say again before, before I'm definitely gonna do partial fractions here. But before we get to partial fractions, do the FAM folks, it's funny, I feel like I'm talking about the family, do the FAM folks have any questions or any specific things you would like to see a little bit more of before we kind of move along? Also, if you're in FAM's class and you don't want to be here today because you want to go study for your midterm, I totally understand. That's perfectly fine as well. Also, now that this is your only opportunity, if you think of a question later, you're welcome to ask it. Um, I have a question about, um, I guess it's about uh, definite integrals, but like um, when you, um, so I know for example, like when you're finding the area, you like take the pi out. Um, I, I, I assume when you, you, you mean volume actually? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, um, I'm just like, um, so like if there's two uh, values, like if it's like r squared minus little r squared, um, do you plug in both of the numbers into both of the r values? Like which one comes first? Sure. Let's do an example. 
Yeah, it's a good question. Also, I saw Merck's, so just to kind of, I saw Merck's was doing some volume stuff that's like what I think of as the weird volume stuff where you're doing like cross sections or squares or triangles or whatever, um, which is just kind of unfortunate because that stuff isn't actually in the syllabus for this class. I feel like you kind of like, you can do whatever I want. Um, but I feel, so for those specific questions, I'll try to make some videos because I think doing it in class, I don't think it's, I don't, I doubt the fam people are going to do that. And so like, I know we, I know we sometimes do stuff in the classes we're doing, but I feel like that stuff specifically, you don't want to do it unless you have to. So I'll try to make some videos on that stuff. Um, find the volume. Yeah, yeah. So exactly. So we're going to do, um, we're going to find the volume of a solid button axis. So let's just make something out of what I want to do. Mm -hmm. Let's make it, yeah, let's do all that. So let's say we have, I don't want to write all the words. So we're going to have the volume of the solid obtained by revolving the region. So the region bounded by, um, let's make it not too terrible, bounded by f of x equal to 10 minus x squared and g of x equal to x squared plus 1. Sure. So the region bounded by those two functions revolved around the x-axis. And of course, the words I'm leaving off are, right? Find the volume of the solid obtained by revolving the region bounded by these functions. Okay. Um, oh, sure. Here's the link to the check-in again, as well as the tutoring link. Um, okay. So let me figure out my question. Right? Where I like wearing my slippers and feet get too hot when I wear my slippers. So I forgot the slippers. Okay, sorry. What's that? All right. So and I'm gonna do this one. I'm gonna try and do this one without graphing it because although it's good to graph it, not always absolutely necessary. So let's see. So if I want to find this volume, the first thing I have to do is I need to know where these functions intersect because I know that those are gonna I need to find that find the integration. So I'm gonna set f of x equal to g of x. And I'm going to get, let's see, so 10 minus x squared. Oh, I, sorry, sorry. My numbers are not exactly what I wanted them to be. Let me fix this by making it x squared plus, uh, let's just do it this way. Let's make it 19 instead of, yeah. Is that right? No, it's okay. 19 minus x squared. Okay. So if f of x is 19 minus x squared and g of x equals x squared plus 1, if I set these equal to each other, I'll add x squared over here to get 2x squared. I'll subtract 1 over here to get 18. Divide by 2. 9 equals x squared. And then x is going to equal not just 3, but plus or minus 3. So those are going to be my limits of integration. Um, now, I know, so here's the thing, right? I know this is going to be this, the washer method because I know that I'm not flush with my axis location. Right? My axis location is the x-axis, and this region, right, neither of my boundaries is y equals 0 or f of x equals 0, which is the x-axis. So I know I'm going to have a situation. I'm going to draw the picture after, but I want to kind of do it without that. So I know it's going to be washer. And I know the volume of a washer is given by pi times the big radius squared minus pi times the little radius squared times the thickness, which if you're going around the x-axis is dx, if you're going around the y-axis is dy. Okay, so now I need to figure out which, my, which is my big radius and which is my little radius. The big radius is the function that's further from the axis of location. So how do I figure that out when I'm graphing it? Well, I look at my functions. I see that I'm going to be between negative 3 and 3. So I know I'm going to be integrating from negative 3 to 3. So I pick a number between negative 3 and 3. I would pick 0 or 1. If I pick 0 or 1, I can see that f of 0 is 19 minus 0, and g of 0 is 0 plus 1. And clearly, between negative 3 and 3, specifically at 0, 
f of x is the bigger function, g of x is the smaller function. We could have picked a different point, right? We could have picked 1, 19 minus 1 is 18, 1 plus 1 is 2, or we could have picked 2, 19 minus 4 is 18, 4 plus 1 is 5. But whatever point you pick between negative 3 and 3 will always tell us the same function is the larger one. Um, here are those links again. So we know that the big radius is f of x, and the little radius is g of x. So my integral, so this is going to look like, so if I'm going to watch what it look like, I like to factor out the pi, and I'll have the big radius, which is going to be 19 minus x squared squared minus the little radius, which is x squared plus 1 squared. So that would be the volume of the washer. And then to find the total volume, we're just going to take this volume, I'm going to bring out the pi, and then I'm going to get this. Which we'll definitely do, even though the numbers are going to be a little bit gross. So let's go to the other side. I'll write that again. Oh, a good picture. It's a picture from, the, from 11B from the review. And I was like, I don't want to erase that. I think it's a good thing. Okay, so here is what we're finding. So we're going to the pi times the integral to negative 3 to 3 of the big radius squared. I don't know why I have the brackets around it in here. I didn't need the brackets in there. Um, minus the little radius squared. Before we do this, let me just show you what the graph looks like. But these are both things that we're pretty capable of graph graphing. Y equals x squared plus 1, just looks like your usual parabola shifted up 1. So it's going to be this parabola here. And 19 minus x squared looks like your usual parabola, but flipped over, so it's jumping downwards, and then shifted up by 19. So it looks something like this. And this is the point 0, 1, and this is the point 0, 19, and these are the points x equals 3, comma, whatever, and x equals negative 3, comma, whatever. So we're taking this region, where the big radius is clearly this function, and the little radius is clearly this function, and we're rotating around the x-axis. So we're looking at a strip like this getting rotated around. Okay, a lot of times the math on these is actually kind of ugly, right? I, my numbers are not particularly nice. We have to square these both out, which gets kind of gross. So we have pi times the of negative 3 to 3. 19 squared is 361. So you get 361 minus 19 times 8 plus 19 is uh, 38 x squared plus x to the fourth minus this thing squared out is x to the fourth plus 2x squared plus 1. And I would simplify this one more step before integrating. So let's see. Um, I get, let's see. The x to the fourth minus the x to the fourth will cancel out. 361 minus 1 will be 350. And then a minus 38x squared minus a 2x squared will be a minus 40x squared. That became a little bit nicer after I simplified. Now I'm going to integrate. So anti-differentiating this, I get 360x. Anti-differentiating this, I get 40x cubed over 3 from negative 3 to 3. And then I just plug in. Remember, we always plug in the top limit first. Yeah, yeah, totally. Actually, I was, I was hoping someone would say that, uh, Fernanda. You're totally right. Instead of doing this, which is kind of, I like, I never love plugging in the negative here because it's kind of gross. But I'm going to do it, but I'll, then I'll also address your question, um, Fernando. But yes, yes, Fernando, we can totally do that. And I'll show it in just one second. Let me show this here first. So we can totally do this, which is going to be, let's see, pi times 360 times 3 minus, now I would simplify as I go here. 40 times 3 cubed over 3, well, 3 cubed is, well, really I don't even want to think it. 3 cubed over 3, I cancel one of the 3s, and 3 squared is 9, and 40 times 9 is 360. Minus, now when we plug in negative 3, I get 360 times negative 3. Minus, again, 40 times negative 3 cubed over 3. Well, one of those 3s cancels and I get a 9, then, but it's like a negative because it makes sense. So I get uh, 
I gotta remind us of these things in case. Right, because it's negative 27 over 3, and that's a negative 9 in this course. Right. And oh, yeah, see, I, I, feel, I always feel like this gets super confusing with all of these um, minuses. But if we look here, look at this. This part here and this part here are opposites of each other, right? This is 360 times 3 minus 360, which is just 360 times 2, right? 3 three sixty is minus 1 360 is 2 three sixty times 7 is 20. And here, same deal, except the negative of that, right? This is negative 3 three sixties plus 1 360. So this is a minus 2 times 360, which is minus 720. Wow, 720, not 270. And then 720 minus negative 720 is exactly pi times 720 plus 720, which is 440. These numbers actually turned out not as ugly as I thought they would. So that's definitely one way you could do it. Now, Fernanda is correct in that at this point here, I could have said, hey, look, and I'm going to raise above here. That's all right. So we have more back to take a picture. Sure, sure, totally. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, what's going on on the other side here? And so what I want to point out to address Fernanda's statement is that once we got to this point here, we could have said, hey, look, I'm integrating from negative 3 to 3, or negative number to positive number, with one of those things. And this function here is an even function, right? You've got 360 times x to the 0 f minus 40 times x squared. When all the powers in your polynomial are even, it is an even function. You can also tell from the picture, right? We have symmetry about the y-axis, so also we can see it's even there. So you can totally say, hey, this is pi times 2 times the integral from 0 to 3 of 360 minus 40x squared. And I do like doing that better. I think it's much easier. Right? We can see that these are just doubling each other. So we can just double it ahead of time and do times that. So we're going to get um, 2 pi. We integrate this, we get the same thing. 360x minus 40 times cubed over 3. And then we just plug in the 3. And we get 2 pi times 360 times 3 minus 40 times 3 cubed over 3 is 40 times 5, which is 360. And then when we plug in the 0, we just get 0 minus 0. So yes, you could totally do it that way. And I would, if you see that easily, I would do it that way because I think it's better. And yeah, it's just easier, maybe not better. So this ends up being the same, right? This is 360 times 3 minus 360 times 1, so it's 360 times 2, which is 720. I get 2 times 720, which is 440. So yes, either way is perfectly fine. Um, but this is a reminder, you're always plugging in the top from the top limit minus the bottom limit. And you do have to, going back to the other side for a second, but you do have to square each of the radiuses. So if the radiuses are kind of messy, it's going to get messier. Let me see, I feel like there was a question in the chat that I might have missed. Let me go back and look real quick. No, I guess not. Okay. Um, I just have a quick question about um, this problem. Sure. Um, so did you do the washer method because it was rotating or, or revolving around the x-axis? Like, was that your... I did the washer method because I was revolving around an axis that I wasn't flush with. So, right? So, so the axis I'm revolving around is not one of my boundaries. Right? This, right, my region doesn't actually touch my axis of rotation. So the idea here is, and so let me try and draw the picture. So this is where, oh, do I have a, I have a good graphing thing. All right, so if I actually rotate this shape around the x axis, so I will point out first of all, rotating this shape around the y axis is not good because the y axis cuts through it. We typically don't want to rotate around axes that are shaped that cut through our shape. So um, but if I try and draw this, I'm going to try and draw this here. Right, these are my drawing skills. Wow, OK, that's great. I'm going to do this here. Wow, this is going to look really good, you guys. <laughs> this is going to look kind of garbage. Sorry, let's try and make this a little bit better. And then on the 
inside. So the thing is, it's kind of so this is kind of like a uh, kind of like a really funky donut. And we're kind of going around like that. Kind of going around like that. So the reason we use the washer method here is because we're cutting out some middle volume, right? And we don't have the right. It kind of looks like it kind of looks like a, a beach ball or a basketball, and you kind of cut out the middle part, right? None of this is in there, and that's why. So when you, you use the washer method, when you're missing some inner kind of um, volume, whereas the disk method. <clears throat> so just as a counterexample, right? If we just had like let's say we had just the function y equal to I don't know. Um, sure, I'll do this. 3x minus x squared and y equals 0, which looks like this. It has x intercepts at 0, 0, and 3, 0. If I revolve this shape around the x axis, I'm not going to be missing any middle part because the axis of rotation, x, the x axis, which is the line y equals 0, is one of my boundaries that is bounding the region I'm revolving. So when the axis of rotation is one of your boundaries, you typically use the disk method, um, right? If I revolve this, my shape is gonna look like, I'm just gonna double this up. Right, we're not missing anything from the middle. It's the whole volume of the solid and there's no like hole through it. So that's kind of the difference. So if I see that y equals zero, which is the x-axis, is one of my boundaries and I'm going around the x-axis, I'm like, oh, I'm gonna use this method because I'm gonna be right next, right flush with my axis. Whereas here, I thought I was going around the x-axis and my boundaries were this function and this function, neither of which is actually the line y equals zero, so I know, oh, I'm not gonna Good question. Thank you. And really, I will say, if you're able to draw the region, you can typically tell if it's if it's nice and sitting along the axis, I flushed with the axis or not. But it depends. Right? Some things are easier to draw than others. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, what time is it? There we got time. Are there other questions before I move on to talking about some partial fractions? I'm just gonna look for some good examples because while I can come up with some, I bet your book has some decent ones here. Sure. Sorry, can you do an average area problem? I'm sorry, could you say that one more time? I didn't quite catch it. Um, average, like I guess like the title of it is like average, average value of a one oh. integral. Yeah. Sure. So what I, here's what I want you to think when you hear the words average value. I want you to think this problem is super straightforward. Average value is nothing more than doing the regular definite integral and then dividing by the length of the interval of integration. So let me actually do, let me do, let me do two different things here. In fact, no, that's actually not a good question. So let me actually just use the, the, the let's, let's look at this function here. Um, sure. So the function I was looking at before, I want to find the area under the curve. So I'm just doing area right now. I'm not doing average value yet. Area under the curve, um, what was it using? Y equal to, um, what was it? Yeah, okay. 3x minus x squared. I should say area under the curve and above the x-axis. For this function here. And I feel like this question is slightly misleading because before I can actually do this, I need to find some integration. Meaning I actually kind of need to think about, okay, this function looks like this parabola. And I'm looking for this area here. 
So I have to find these limits of integration. I have to find those points of intersection. So you need to figure out where this function and this function intersect. Essentially, I need to find the x-intercept. I need to set this equal to zero. So setting 3x minus x squared equal to zero. Wow, okay. Um, I get x times 3 minus x equal to zero. So x equal to zero and x equal to three. And then we'll point out you should always solve this by factoring. You don't want to like bring x squared over and divide by x. That's going to be bad news. Um, also, here's the attendant and the tutoring. I don't think I'll do that one more time. So these are my limits of integration. So the area is going to be the integral from 0 to 3 of 3x minus x squared dx. I'm going to calculate it. So I'm going to get 3x squared minus x cubed over 3. 0 to 3. So that's going to be, let's see, 3 times 3 squared minus 3 cubed over 3. I feel like I made a mistake. I definitely made a mistake. What's the mistake I made? You didn't, Specifically put, when I, the, you didn't put a 2 on the bottom mm -hmm. of the 3 squared. Yeah, definitely. Minus, and although I know I'm getting zero, I'm still going to show right. I get three times zero squared over two minus zero cubed over three. But all of this is just zero. So here's what I'm getting. I get, let's see, three times nine is 27 over two. Minus three cubed over three is 27 over three, which reduces to nine. Um, 27 over two minus nine is going to be 27 over two minus 18 over two, which is going to be nine over two. So you've got nine over two or 4.5. Either way. So that's the area under the curve. Okay, so now, let me just let me do this. So if you, can find, if you can find area under a curve, you can definitely find average value. So, the average value of this function, y equal to 3x minus x squared, on the interval from 0 to 3 is just the integral divided by 3, or the area divided by the length. What does it say after and, and above the x-axis? Sorry about that. Yeah. No, my writing is not the best there. So the average value of this function is just the integral we just calculated divided by the length of this interval. So basically you're taking area and you're dividing by length to figure out what the height would be. So this is just going to be the nine halves we found divided by three. This is going to be nine halves times one third, which is just three halves. And what we're okay. saying with this, actually, if you're interested, uh, I need to draw on the other side of the board. You can go back to what we would say. All we're really saying with this is basically for this function here, right, if you took this function, and a student kind of explained it to me this way, if, you, if this were like all of the sand in an um, ant farm, and you shook it all up so that it was level, what would the height be if it leveled out? Well, the height would be the average value because, I'm looking at here, sorry, we got uh, three halves. Sure, sure. Maybe something like about there, right? If I look at this rectangle, right, I'm just redistributing the area so that it's all at the same height. And that's all I'm doing because, again, Right, if I'm thinking about the, the area divided by the length should equal the average height or the average value, but the area is just the area under the curve, right? Whether it's the green area we distributed or the blue area like they were doing. So long story short, average value, you just take your integral and divide by the length of the interval of integration, meaning the difference between whatever those two values are that are the limits of integration. So like for this, we always have to do like the integration and plugging in like our 
values, right? Like we always have to start off with that. Yes, you for for an average value, unless they've already given you it somehow, you will always have to find the definite interval because you're always oh. finding the area and then you're dividing by the length. I think. Yeah, it's a good question. But back to my original point, what I want you to think when you hear or read the words average value is like, oh, this is going to be straightforward. I'm just going to find the definite integral and then I'm going to divide by whatever the length is. It's not, it's not really any harder than finding just the definite integral. There's just one additional tiny step. Okay. All right, so I think, so not that I won't answer any more fan questions, I definitely will, but I think I've answered enough of them that I feel like it's okay to go do some other stuff for a minute. So let's do some partial fractions examples. Um, for those of you in Pam's class, I would like to imagine eventually you'll get to partial fractions. Um, you definitely should, but you it's perfectly fine to tune out for now if you want to, just because um, this definitely won't be on your midterm. And I would imagine you want to kind of study for a midterm. So let's look at you know, that, that example looks sure nice and terrible. Let's look at this. I mean not really terrible. So let's look at that's eh, actually not that bad. So we have interval. This is this problem 26 from section 6.3 in case you're curious. 3x squared minus 7x minus 2 over x cubed minus x. And the reason I'm using this problem for the book is because I'm imagining they actually did set it up somewhat nicely. It could be terrible. I don't actually know. Okay, so when I look at this interval, the question I ask myself first is, could I do a u substitution? And the answer is almost yes, but not quite, right? I'm just going to show you. So you don't need to write them. If I let u equal x cubed minus x, then my du is 3x squared minus 1 dx. And if I happen to have exactly 3x squared minus 1 on top, or a multiple of that, then I would be good. Right? If, for example, just as an aside, if my integral was like uh, 12x squared minus 4, over x cubed minus x. While you still could use partial fractions, you shouldn't here. But you should be like, oh, u is this, du is this, and I exactly have on top four times 3x squared minus one. And so in this particular problem, it's different. Right here, there's my du. So this one would be super straightforward. This would just be the integral of 4 over u du, which would be 4 natural log of the absolute value of u plus c, which would be 4 natural log of the absolute value of whatever u was, right, x cubed minus x. So what I want to point out is even if you think something is partial fractions, you should at least do a quick check of letting u equal the bottom, because du might actually end up being exactly the top or a multiple of it. Uh, but if it's not exactly the top or a multiple of it, then cut your losses and go on to partial fractions. So how do we know we can use partial fractions? Well, there have to be two things that are true. The degree on top has to be less, which is definitely true, right? Two is less than three. And we have to be able to factor the denominator. And we definitely can factor the denominator, right? So this factors as, so I'm just going to write out the partial fraction decomposition. So the denominator I can factor out x. I don't know if x is x or minus one, and that factors further as x minus one times x plus one. So you do need to factor it as much as possible. Okay. So now that we've rewritten our integrand, completely factored in the denominator, we're going to write it down. So here I see three distinct linear factors. They're all to the first power, meaning they're each only going to show up once. So I'm going to write this as a over x plus b over x minus 1 plus c over x minus 1. Order here is not in any particular order. The order I've written it in is the order I've written these factors in down here. But there's no specific way of doing it. Let's get tenants again. Um, so then, if you remember what you're doing, I always have to think about I am multiplying this whole equation by the common denominator, x times x minus 1 times x plus 1. 
You don't have to write this out, but I find it helpful to make sure I'm doing the right thing. So whenever I multiply this by this, the whole denominator should cancel, right? All of the denominators should end up canceling. Here they exactly cancel, and you're left with just the top. When I multiply by this, the x's cancel. I'm left with a times x minus 1 times x plus 1. When I multiply by the second term, the x minus 1's cancel. And you get b times x times x minus 1. When I multiply here, the x plus 1's cancel. You get c times x times x minus 1. When you do this, you should always end up with no denominators. Okay, and now, since all of these are distinct, and they're all to the first power. It's going to, so when they're all to the first power like this, it's really straightforward. You just get to pick all the nice values of x and you'll find a, b, and c pretty quickly. So letting x equals zero, I get zero minus zero minus two on the left. And I get a times negative one times one. And I really don't want to write out the rest of the terms. So the rest of the terms are b times zero and c times zero, which is going to be zero. So I get this. So I get negative 2 equal to negative a, so a is equal to 2. What are we going to pick for x next? Oops, I didn't need to write it down. I wanted, I wanted to wait, but I wrote x equal to 1. I'm going to put an x equal to 1. Now I have to put in 1 for every instance of x. So I get 3 times 1 squared minus 7 times 1 minus 2. 3 minus 7 minus 2 is negative 6. And then I'm going to plug in 1 for x here. So 1 here gives me a 0. 1 there gives me a 0. Oops. So clearly I wrote something wrong. I definitely wrote something wrong. So, so, so let's see how I made a mistake here. So I plug in 1, I get 0, 0, 0. The negative 6 shouldn't be able to equal 0, which means I made a mistake. The mistake I made was when I distributed the second term here, I was supposed to cancel the x minus 1s and left with an x plus 1. So that should be a plus 1 there. Um, so let's see, I've got negative 6 on the left, I've got plugging in 1 here, I get 0, plugging in 1 here, I get b times 1 times 2, so that's 2b, and that's going to give me b equal to negative 3. And lastly, and I will ask you guys this time, what should I, what's the last thing I should plug in for x that's convenient? Yeah, exactly, Fernanda, negative 1, right? The way I think about it is it's all the, all the numbers that make something zero, or all the values of x that make the denominator zero here. So zero here, one here, negative one there. So here I'm going to do, let's see, so plugging in negative one, I get three plus seven minus two, that's ten minus two, which is eight, equal to zero, zero. Plugging in the negative one there, I get c times negative one times negative one minus one is negative two. So I get eight equal to two c, so c is equal to four. Okay, so then we're going to go back and we're going to say, all right, I'm going to rewrite my integral as the integral of a over x plus, or so plus negative 3 over x minus 1, or minus 3 over x minus 1, plus 4 over x plus 1. Remember, right, we're just rewriting this fraction as its partial fraction decomposition. And the point is that now it's supposed to be pretty easy to integrate. Let's erase this part here. And we end up with, so I, so when I read this, I mean, so I'll show you an extra step here, but I wouldn't write this out unless I had to. I'm thinking of this as two times one over x. I'm thinking of this as minus three times one over x minus one. I'm thinking of this as, four times one over x plus one. So they get, well, two times the integral of one over x is the natural log of the absolute value of x. So minus three times the integral of one over x minus one is the natural log of the absolute value of x minus one. Plus four times the integral of the one over x plus one is the natural log of the absolute value of x plus one. Plus c. And you could put those all together in one large logarithm. I don't think you need to unless you're specifically asked to. But I don't think you'd really be asked to. That seems like a silly thing to ask. Um, okay. Let's see here. Uh, let's look at another one here. Hmm. Sure.
And then, so after this next one, I'm certainly happy to do more of them if you want, but if you guys have other questions you want to ask, I will certainly be happy to address them as well. So let's look at this integral. Uh, this is problem 31 from the textbook. I'm rewriting it slightly. 3x squared plus 3x plus 1 over um, x cubed plus 2x squared plus x dx. So again, we have a partial fraction situation. Well, again, I suppose I should double check, right? The top looks like it could be the derivative of the bottom, so I'm just gonna do a quick check. If u was x cubed plus 2x squared plus x, I'm pretty sure that's not gonna work out. So I am gonna get du equal to 3x squared, but the, then I'm gonna get the derivative of 2x squared is up 4x plus 1. Ah, it's so close. If that was 4x instead of 3x, I could totally make it work. But I don't want to try and make it. There are things you can do to kind of break this up into different pieces. You shouldn't do that. If it doesn't work exactly, go with partial fractions. If partial fractions is an option, which it is, because the degree on top is less and the bottom factors. So I'm going to write the bottom as I'm going to factor out an x. I'm left with x squared plus 2x plus 1, which does factor as x plus 1 squared. All right, this is. And the numerator, just leave it as it is. Okay, so this one is a little bit different in that now I have a repeated linear factor. Right? I have x plus 1, which is a linear factor, but it's squared, meaning it's repeated, or it's x plus 1 times x plus 1. Um, I do think when you're writing these down, it's really disadvantageous to write it like that, right? If you wrote it like that, you could you might confuse yourself and write it as a over x plus b over x plus one plus c over x plus one. And that's not correct. I think you really want to write any repeated factors as that factor to whatever the appropriate power is. In this case, it's the second power. And then here's how we're going to write the partial fraction decomposition. It's going to be a over x. And then I'm going to have b over x plus one squared, but also the lesser power. So I usually write the lesser powers first. But I know I need to have you know, b over x plus 1 to the first and c over x plus 1 to the second. And if this was x plus 1 to the fifth, I would need the fifth power and all of the lower powers. So the fifth, fourth, third, second, and first. Hopefully, no one gives you that kind of problem because it's kind of gross. All right, we're going to do the same usual thing. We're going to multiply all of this by the common denominator. This is not my good red pen. This pen is trash. Um, okay, so multiply well, everything by this. Again, over here, we just get the numerator. So I get 3x squared plus 3x plus 1. Over here, again, things cancel. So this times this, the x's cancel. I get a times x plus 1 squared. Here, one of the x plus 1's cancel. So I get b times x times x plus 1. And here, both of the x plus 1's cancel, or x plus 1 squared and x plus 1 squared cancel. So I get c times x. And then we're going to do the same sort of thing. We're going to pick the convenient value. So I can see that x equal to 0 makes this denominator 0, and x equal to negative 1 makes those denominators 0. So those are my two convenient values of x today. So I pick x equal to 0. I'm going to get, let's see, 0 plus 0 plus 1 equal to a times 0 plus 1 squared is 1 and then b times 0 and c times 0. So I get a equal to 1. Let's erase this one. Plugging in x equal to negative 1, I get 3 minus 3, right? Because 3 times negative 1 squared is positive 3. 3 times negative 1 is negative 3. So I get 3 minus 3 plus 1. So I get 1 on the left. And plugging in negative 1 on the right, I get 0, 0, and c times negative 1. So I end up with c equal to negative 1. And then here's what typically happens. In fact, uh, here's the attendance again. Here's what always happens. This is always going to be true when you have a repeated factor, when you have something to a square or a third or whatever, is you're going to run out of convenient values of x. Right? You're not going to have enough. So after that, you have to kind of do something else. And your options are, so here's all I'll say. If you only have one more thing to find, I only have b left to find. You can pick any other value of x you want. 
you can totally, and I don't like to do it this way, but you can totally pick x equal to say, um, let's say I've used zero and negative one, let's pick x equal to one, and this will totally work. So it's, it's not my favorite, though, right? Because if I do this, I get three plus three plus one, so seven, and I get a, which is one, times one plus one squared, which is two squared, which is four, plus b, which I don't know yet, times one times two, plus c, which I do know is negative one, times one. And then I can solve for b. So 7 equals 4 plus 2b minus 1. 4 minus 1 is 3. 7 minus 3 is 4. So I get 4 equal to 2b. I get b equal to 2. That's a perfectly fine way to do it. And it works perfectly well if you only have one thing left to find. But if there are multiple things left to find, I really don't care for this method because it gets messy. What I think is a better method, which I would have done anyway, is for this, so for finding v, instead of doing this, I would have done what's called equating coefficients. So I'm going to look at, I usually like to start with the highest power, so x squared. So on the left hand side, how much x squared do I have? I'm not good at using a straw, by the way. Frequently, I will be sipping and then I will put it the water comes out. That just happened. It was really, really good. Yeah, three on the left. But if we have three x squared on the left, we have to have the same amount of x squared on the right. So I'm we'll looking at my amount of x squared. If I multiply this out, this would be a times x squared times some lower terms. I'd have an a times x squared. This would be b times x squared. And no c times x squared. So the amount of x squared on the left is three. The amount of x squared on the right is a plus b. And they have to equal each other. And knowing that a is equal to 1, I have to get that b is equal to 2. Right? There's no other choice. So that's the way I would encourage you to do a problem like this. It just, I think it works better. Um, so, I want you guys to finish off this problem because I need to go to the restroom. But let me just remind you. So here's what we've got. We've got this integral of 3x squared plus 3x plus 1 over x times x plus 1 squared is now equal to a over x. Right? So it's a over x, b over x plus 1, c over x plus 1 squared. So a is 1, b is 2. And c was negative 1, I believe, yeah. We go ahead and finish this off doing the integration, and I will be right back. Pardon my absence.
Okay. So here's how this will work out. Um, you can do a U set if you need to here. I don't really feel like you need to. Um, I've got the integral of one over x plus two times one over x plus one. And I often, if it helps, I like to think of this as minus x plus one to the negative two. And so for these ones where it's one over x to the first power, like this, and it's only x to the first, you're going to just use the natural log. When something, when some other power of x, it's not just the natural log of the bottom. So this is going to be the natural log of the absolute value of x plus two times the natural log of the absolute value of x plus one. And then in reading this, I'm going to use the power rule and say, okay, well, this is essentially u to the negative two. And the antiderivative is my u to the negative two plus one divided by negative one. Which ends up being, I mean, you could leave it like this. I just like right, let's say negative, negative, positive. So this is positive x plus one to the negative first, or positive one over x plus one. And that's how I would prefer to write my answer, but other ways are fine. Are there questions about this? Is, is that what you would always do if um, something's to the power, like, like would you always do the power rule there to? So if the power in the denominator is something other than one, actually this is right, this is to the first, this is to the first. When you have something like, well actually let me, just, let me show an example. But yes, the, the short answer is yes. The long answer is let me show you some stuff. So in fact, yeah. So let's look at three, we'll do like, yeah. Let's say I have one over x, one over two x minus three. I don't know, let's find out we're quite there yet, sure. One over x plus five. So I'm going to show you all these integrals real quick because they're all fast if you remember what to do. So these are all mini u sums. Let's get to the first one. The integral here is the natural log of the absolute value of x because the derivative is one over x. The integral here is the natural log of the absolute value of x plus five because the derivative of the natural log of x plus five is one over x plus five times the derivative of the stuff, but the derivative of x plus five is just one. So you get one over x plus five times one, which is exactly what we have. Here, it could be, there's a little bit more to do. The integral is not just the natural log of the absolute value of two x minus three, because the derivative of the natural log of two x minus three is one over two x minus three times two. But I don't have a times two here, so I have to divide by two or multiply by one half so the, the derivative of this actually is that. And because now the derivative of this is one half times one over two x minus three times two, and the one half and the two cancel out. Similarly here, the integral isn't just the natural log of four minus three x, it's natural log of four minus three x divided by negative three, or times negative one third. Because again, the derivative of your chain rule part makes you multiply by negative three, so we need to divide by negative three to account for that. So, are there questions about this before I move on to kind of answering the other question that Mark had? Because I think it was Mark that was in that. Okay, so now, maybe I'll have enough room here. If I was going to integrate like 1 over x squared, I would just write it as the integral of x to the negative 2, which is going to be x to the negative 1 over negative 1, which is negative 1 over x. Plus, if I was going to integrate 1 over x cubed, I would get the integral of x to the negative third, which is x to the negative second divided by negative 2, plus c, which I would write as 
negative one over two x squared. Right? I like to bring the negative up to the top, or actually, really, I like to bring the negative out to the front. The two stays in the bottom, the x comes down to have a power that is a positive to the negative. But really, you could write it like this and that would be fine. Okay. So, but what if now I had something like 1 over x plus 5 squared? Well, the same sort of thing applies, right? I'm going to get, instead of the natural law right here, I'm going to get, well, 1 over x squared, the integral was x to the minus 1 over minus 1. Well, the same sort of thing is going to be true here. I'm going to get x plus 5 to the minus 1 over minus 1, because this is really the integral of x plus 5 to the minus 2. And there's no chain rule thing to account for because the coefficient of x is just 1. Right? If I rewrite this, I can rewrite this as negative 1 over x plus 5. Let's see. But the point here is that the derivative of this, if I use the power rule, the negative 1 comes down, I get negative 1 times x plus 5 to the negative second, the negative 1's cancel, and I get exactly this. And the chain rule that I would multiply by would be 1 because the derivative of the stuff is just 1. Okay, but things get a little bit different if I'm doing something like this. So if I want to do like integral of 1 over 2x minus 3 squared dx, which I'm definitely going to think of as the integral of 2x minus 3 to the negative second. So here's what I know is going to happen. I'm still going to use the power rule. I could totally do a u sub here. In fact, I might do a u sub at the end. But I know if I let u equal 2x minus 3, I'm going to have u to the minus 2. I'm essentially going to be using the reverse power rule. I'm going to add 1 to the power and divide by the power. So I don't want to erase this just yet. So I'm going to get 2x minus 3 to the minus 1 divided by minus 1. But that's not quite right. Because I know when I differentiate this, I'm going to get negative 1 times 2x minus 3 to the negative 2. So then I have to multiply by the derivative of the inside, which is 2. I don't have a 2 there, so I'm going to have to divide by 2, just like I did in this problem, to account for the eventual chain rule multiplication. So my answer ends up looking like 1 half times, uh, I'm going to write this as negative 1 over 2x minus 3. Or 2x minus 3 to the negative 1 over negative 1 divided by 2. And there's an extra division by 2 because of the coefficient here. And the same thing would be true, or the same sort of thing would be true if I was doing like the integral of 1 over 2x minus 3 to the third. I would write it as the integral of 2x minus 3 to the negative 3. And then I would just use my basic power rule. I would get 2x minus 3 to the negative second divided by negative 2. And then I also have to divide by another 2 because of the 2 right there. Right? Because when I differentiate this, there's going to be a multiple of 2 that comes from the chain rule, then this one half will cancel that out. And you could leave it like this. I might rewrite it as something like negative one-fourth times one over two x minus three squared. But the point is that instead of doing the u substitution here, I'm just using the power rule and then being like, oh, well, my u sub would write my u sub. So just to kind of spell it out. Ah, sorry. If I was doing this problem with a u substitution, my u sub would have been u equal to two x minus three my du would have been 2dx, so 1 half du would equal dx, by the way, that's where the 1 half is coming from, right there. And then this integral becomes the integral of, let's see, dx is 1 half du, and this is u to the negative third. And then I integrate and I get u to the negative 2 divided by negative 2 times 1 half, which is exactly this, right? That's just my, oh yeah, that's one half. There's my u, right? 2x minus 3 to the negative 2 over 
So you certainly could do the U substitution if you're going to integrate something like that, but very long story short, you don't have to. Right? You can do it this kind of shorter way. Right? I should say the caveat there is your professor might want you to show your work, although I don't know. I feel like if this was a question on fan stuff, a lot of his stuff is multiple choice. If I were taking this test, by the way, I would still try and show as much work as possible. I know I think you guys said there's no partial credit, but even then, I would still show my work and try and argue for credit later <laughs> if I needed to. Some professors are easier to argue with than others. So let me give you guys this question. I want you to try this one. Try, the, with, with, try to do this one without doing the substitution. So it's the integral of one over five x plus one to the eighth power dx. And I would encourage you to rewrite it as something to a negative power, which I totally don't have to be secretive about. Right. So try doing that integral without doing the use of. I'll give you, I'll give you 80 seconds. Seems like too many, but I'll wait a bit. Um, there's, there's the attendance and the tutoring links again, if you haven't done the attendance yet, please do it. Does anyone, I, sorry, I still owe you guys 30 more seconds. <laughs> Okay, plus one. So the way we're gonna do this, right? We're just gonna use the reverse power rule. It's gonna be five x plus one to the negative seventh divided by the new power. And then what else do I need that I haven't written in there yet? Exactly. We need to have a one fifth or a division by five, either way. And it's probably perfectly fine to leave your answer this way, but if you want to write it in a nicer way. This kind of the most simplified version, in my opinion, would be um, negative, right? Because it is negative overall. One over five times seven is 35 times five minus plus one to the seventh power. This is how I would prefer to express my answer if I was given the choice about how to write it. Sorry, I said this kind of a player there for my close and stuff. It's less glary. Um, so yeah, that's how I got my answer. All right, let's see. What else? What else do you guys want to talk about? I mean, I can, we need more of this, but I can, we can also talk about other things. We have other questions. Um, oh, I think, oh, that's a good one. Um, sorry, I know I said what else, and then I immediately looked away. Oh, okay. I got I got a question. No, I'm gonna make this okay. Sure, this is maybe not gonna suck. Okay. That's that's let's try this one. So let's look at this integral. This is definite integral from zero to one of x cubed minus one over x squared minus one. And a couple things I notice. I notice one, I can't use partial fractions because the degree on top is greater than the degree on the bottom. 
Well, at least I can't use partial fractions yet. Um, but I don't really see any other good way of doing this, right? I can't, I can't do a u sub that's gonna be nice, right? I could let u equal the bottom and du would be two x, which does not seem helpful, or two x dx, I should say. So I'm thinking it's probably partial fractions where I first have to do um, polynomial division. So let's do the division. And so when I do this polynomial division, I like to write out all the terms, meaning, so the top part goes inside here, and I'm not just write x cubed minus one, I'm write x cubed, and all the missing terms, zero x squared, zero x minus one. And by the way, in case you care, this is problem 38 from the same section, section 6.3. And on top, or sorry, out here, I'm gonna write x cubed, oh, sorry, not x cubed, <laughs> x squared plus zero x minus four. You don't absolutely have to write these, but I find it helpful <clears throat> to make sure things line up when I do my multiplication. So what do I multiply x squared to x cubed? X. X times x squared is x cubed. X times zero x is zero x squared. X times negative four is negative four x. I subtract. This minus this is zero. This minus this is zero. This minus this is positive four x and negative one comes down. And since the degree here is now less than the degree here, I stop, right? I can't do any more division. So I can rewrite this integral as the integral of x, right, the quotient, plus the remainder over the divisor. Hmm, and actually this brings up a good point. So, I'm gonna write it, I'm, I'm gonna come back to this in a sec, but I wanna show you something slightly different because I've definitely seen professors do things like this before and they kinda wanna make you aware of it. So, so don't, so leave some space for that problem. We're gonna come back to it, but I wanna show you something else real, real quick. So let's say we had virtually the same problem. This is my good red pen, maybe. Let's say we had x cubed instead of x squared minus four. Sorry, x cubed instead of x cubed minus one. Um, uh, dumb games. Is that dumb? No, it's still reasonable. Yeah. Have you guys talked about back substitution? It's okay if the answer is no. I don't, I kind of hope you haven't, but I don't know. Anybody, anybody, back substitution? All right, not hearing you. No, okay, that's fine. It's fine enough to know. Don't worry about it. I don't want to, I don't want to introduce new things because it's, it's a, yeah. Don't worry about back substitution unless we have to later. So here I would do the same thing. I do the division. I'm going to do it kind of lazily this time because I already know how this work out. So x squared goes into x cubed x times. You multiply, you get x cubed minus 4x. <clears throat> There's nothing else here. We subtract 0. Nothing minus minus four x is four x. This is my remainder. So this is equal to the integral of x plus four x over x squared minus four. And although I could factor the denominator here and um, do partial fractions, I shouldn't. Because in this case, I can totally do a u substitution for this integral here, right? I can say, oh, look u is x squared minus 4, du is 2x dx, so the integral of 4x over x squared minus 4 is just the integral of, let's see, 4x is 2 times 2x, so I've got a 2du equals a 4x dx, so this 4x dx is 2du, and the x squared minus 4 is u. So this becomes 2 natural log of the opposite value of u, which is just 2 natural log of the opposite value of x squared minus 4. And we can see that the derivative of this is exactly 2 times 1 over x squared minus 4 times the derivative of x squared minus 4, which is 2x. And 2 times 2x over x squared minus 4 is exactly this. So this integral, you wouldn't use partial fractions for. You'd be like, oh, the remaining part is a nice substitution. So when I integrate this, I get 
integral of x is x squared over 2. And the integral of this we just showed was 2 times the natural log of the absolute value of x squared minus 0 to 1. And then we plug in, we plug in 1 first, and we get 1 over 2 plus 2 natural log of 1 minus 4 is negative 3, the absolute value of negative 3 is 3. So I would do it like that, right? So I don't want to write the absolute values anymore. Minus, and I plug in 0, and I get 0 plus 2 natural log of 0 minus 4 is negative 4, the absolute value is 4. So I'd write my final answer as 1 half plus 2 natural log of 3 minus 2 natural log of 4. And if you wanted to, you could combine these natural logs to get something different looking, but I would just leave it like that. So the story I'm trying to tell here is that after you do a partial, uh, <laughs> after you do a polynomial division, don't automatically assume the remaining fraction is going to be partial fractions. It might be a nice new substitution. So again, before you use partial fractions, you should always at least think, is there a use of that would be easier? Is the derivative of the bottom exactly the top or a multiple of the top? Which is not the case here. Here, we definitely could not do this using a use of, right? It's not nice. So in this case, we are in partial fractions. Now here's the thing. I really, really, really am not a fan of writing out the integral with all the partial fraction stuff with limits of integration. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the partial fractions for that, and then I'm actually going to find the antiderivative as well. So I'm going to write, well, maybe not, I'll see. We'll see. So here's what I got. I got 4x minus 1 over the bottom factors as x minus 2 times x plus 2. Do be careful. I've definitely seen people factor that wrong as like x minus 2 quantity squared. This is x minus 2 times x plus 2. It's going to equal a over x minus 2 plus b over x plus 2. Multiply both sides by this denominator. And as always happens, we multiply it here. The denominators cancel, and you're just left with the top, which is 4x minus 1. We multiply it here, the x minus 2s cancel, you get a times x plus 2. Multiply it here, the x plus 2s cancel, you get b times x minus 2. Now, I want to point something out just because I think it's kind of interesting. We could totally use convenient values here, and we totally should use convenient values here. But you could also make coefficients, right? It'd be perfectly natural to say, okay, well, for x, I have a 4 on the left, I have an a times x plus a b times x on the right. And for the constant term, on the left I have a negative 1, on the right I have an a times 2, and a b times negative 2. And if you wanted to, you could use equating coefficients to solve for a and b this way. I don't really think we should, but it does work. I would instead do it the normal way, say, okay, I'm going to pick x equal to negative 2. If I do that, I get negative 8 minus 1 is negative 9 equal to a times 0 plus b times negative 4. So that's a 4, not a 9. So b is equal to negative 9 over negative 4, which is 9 fourths. And then a should be 7 fourths, but let's actually do the work. I'm going to pick x equal to 2. How do I know a is 7 fourths? Because I know that a is 4 minus b, and 4 minus 9 fourths is 16 fourths, minus 9 fourths is 7 fourths. If I pick x equal to 2, I get 8 minus 1 is 7. I get a times 4 plus b times 0. So yeah, a is 7 fourths. OK. So then I would go back, and I would probably write out the integral. So I'm going to write this as the integral of x plus a, which is 7 fourths over x minus 2, and b, which is 7, 9 fourths over x minus 2. This is getting kind of gross looking. a little bit, right? It's that, which we figured out was sorry, not x plus 1, x plus 4x minus 1 over x minus 4. And we just figured out that that was equal to x plus the integral. So 4x minus 1 over x minus 4 became a over x minus 2, which is 9, oops, 
it is 7 fourths. 7 fourths over x minus 2 plus 9 fourths over x plus 2. And here's what I would say. When I'm going to integrate 7 fourths over x minus 2, I'm ignoring the 7 fourths. It's just a constant multiple. I'm thinking of this as 1 over x minus 2 that's multiplied by 7 fourths. So when I anti differentiate this, here's what I get anti derivative x, x squared over 2. Anti derivative of 7 fourths times 1 over x minus 2, because that's what I'm really thinking of here, is it's 7 fourths times 1 over x minus 2 is 7 fourths times the natural log of the absolute value of x minus 2. Same deal here, this is going to be 9 fourths times the natural log of the absolute value of x plus 2. I don't need a plus c because it's definite, I just need my limit of integration. All right, let's do this kind of quick. I'm going to plug in 1, I'm going to get 1 half plus 7 fourths times natural log. 1 minus 2 is negative 1, absolute value of negative 1 is 1. Natural log of 1 is 0, so I'm actually going to get a 0 from that second term. And then I'm going to get a 9 fourths times a natural log of 3 which is not zero. Minus, I'm going to plug in zero, I'm going to get zero here. Now, here's where I want you to be extra super careful, right? You don't always get all zeros from plugging in zero. I don't here. I plug in zero here, so I get zero. Plugging in zero here, I don't get zero. I get 7 fourths natural log of two, right? Because absolutely I have negative two is two. So I get 7 fourths natural log of two, a two, believe it or not. <laughs> And then I get 9 fourths natural log of 2 as well. And I would probably put these together because they do happen to be the same thing. So I write this as 1 half plus 9 fourths natural log of 3, 7 fourths plus 9 fourths and 16 fourths, which is 4. So I write minus 4 natural log of 2. And that was my final answer. All right, so there's a lot of partial fraction stuff. Um, I know the Mertz people are also doing a lot of improper, why not if you're doing it? I saw that you were doing improper integrals and I definitely posted some videos about improper integration. So you should definitely go watch those if you are having questions about improper integrals. And I think I covered all of the major types. Oh, I didn't do that. So there's one other type I didn't really cover. Um, maybe I'll try to make a couple more videos where you have, yeah, okay. I didn't do any of the types where you have a place where it's undefined and an infinity, which are kind of terrible. But um, I would say if you have questions about improper integrals, look at the videos. I think there's a lot of good examples there. If you still have questions after you look at the videos, send me a message and ask me, like, James, I would like you to do one like this. If you didn't do any like that, I'd be happy to do that for you. So I'll try and, so let me write that down actually. So improper, maybe some more. And then, oh yeah, and I'll try and make an example or two of the terrible volume ones that he's doing where it's like the cross-sectional area. Yeah, I don't know why he's covering that, but apparently he is. So I'll try and make a video for that too in the near future. Also, last thing, um, there was something else. Your quizzes you took, I will definitely get those graded today, especially for those of you in FAM, I mean, I'll grade everyone, but for those of you in FAM's class, I want to grade them today before you potentially take the midterm tomorrow. So I would definitely, if I were taking a midterm, I wouldn't take it early unless I really had nothing else to do. Um, I would wait until tomorrow. I would at least wait until I graded your quizzes just so you could get that feedback, but you should do whatever you want. All right, good seeing you guys. I will see you next week. Don't hesitate to ask questions in discussion or send me a message, use the tutoring, all the good stuff. All right, I'll talk to you later.